Welcome to I Hate It Here, the podcast for HR and people professionals, making the hardest job in the world just a little bit easier. I'm Hibba Youssef. The future of work cannot be sustained. We cannot get to a future if we don't have trust. As managers, as leaders, we also have to take accountability for when we do fail our team, right? And when we do fail ourselves, because don't you want to be the best manager? Do your employees trust you that you have their best interest in mind? A lot of the things that are that we're battling with in the workplace are rooted in emotion. I was socialized in a household where we didn't talk about tough things. I can't move through my life uh, with the covers over my head. I can't move through because other people that I'm managing need something from me and I'm going to get the best out of them when I meet them at a level of not just basic bones. Put the wild world of social media to work for your organization with Hootsuite. Broadcast new job opportunities and empower your workforce to share your brand's content with their networks. Find out how at Hootsuite.com. Are you struggling to prove the value of your performance management programs to your executive team? You need 15.5. 15.5's easy-to-use software enables HR leaders to continuously measure the impact of performance to drive business results. Visit 15.5.com slash demo to schedule a demo today. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the I Hate It Here podcast, where we talk about the things and the challenges that HR people are facing today. And joining me today, I'm so excited about this. Minda Hartz is joining me today, and I'll give her a second to introduce herself. Minda, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Hippa, for having me. Honored to be here. Hey, everybody. My name is Minda Hartz, and um, I'm an author and speaker and have three books, and i um, happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so pumped, y'all. I just like held up her book because obviously I have a copy of it. It was amazing. It's called The Memo. That's one of three. And now you just said there's a fourth one that's coming out. And I want to talk today about it because I was so excited when I saw you post about it on Twitter. What inspired this fourth book that's coming out soon? Yes. Well, thank you. I, uh, with really all my books, the memo right within and you were more than magic. I always say, said that, oh, I don't have any more books in me. I don't have anything left to say. If anybody's had to write a book, then you know, like 75,000 words without really sounding redundant is a lot of work. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, what? I don't think I have anything else to add. To the workplace conversation and then I had stayed in that space you know I'm going to give myself a break because I wrote three books in four years and so uh, one day at three o'clock in the morning I like woke up and had one of these like aha moments and I said you know we can't get to any equitable place in the workplace without trust and it was really I started to think about all the trust issues that all of us have whether you're a woman a man You know, you're over 50, you're single, you're partnered, whatever, however you might identify, everyone is like side eyeing each other in the workplace. And I wanted to be able to write about how we bring a necessary core value of trust because you can't do your best work if you don't trust the people you work with. When I saw you post about it, I was so excited because it's something I talk about quite a bit. Like, how do we as HR professionals even build trust with our employees? And we'll get to that in a little bit. I have a question about that. But When you were thinking about writing this book, what were some of the common challenges that you saw when it came to building workplace trust? But you and I know that people, it's not a new concept to talk about trust. But what I realized is um, at many times we're pretty siloed in the workplace. And so I thought about the times I didn't trust my manager. I thought about the times that I didn't trust my colleagues. And I think about the workplace landscape that we have right now where managers and leaders, they act like they have insurance on trust. Like you work here, you have to trust me. And it's like trust is earned, right? If you've been telling me that racial equity is important for the last two years, and now I see that we're regressing in the workplace on our commitments, how can I trust that I have a place at this at this employer, you know, or how can I feel like I belong? And even as a white male, you know, they're not trusting of what's going on in the workplace because they see different things happening. And so Again, for me, I think that trust is a core value that all of us have access to. We just have to tap into it. And I think that a lot of companies want to solve with the million dollar initiative when we all have it right within it. Us, we just have to tap in and we have to restore trust or create trust, right? It doesn't just click our heels together like Dorothy and it just appears, right? It takes it takes work. And so for me, I just think we talk about trust, but people aren't. They're missing the action 
there's an action that has to take place before we get to trust. I find that so interesting because I've definitely been in high trust environments and low trust environments. And I get you can like see the difference very clearly in your like day to day, the work being done, how your colleagues talk to each other in a high trust versus low trust environment is fascinating to me. And I think one of the biggest differentiators I've seen personally is the leaders at like a high trust versus a low trust environment. And so when you were writing this book and thinking about this concept of trust in the workplace, how much did you talk about the leaders? Well, it's funny because I'm writing the book right now and I'm (laughs) heavy, heavy into leaders. And so I look at it from kind of three dimensions. As an individual employee, how do we speak in a language that we need in the workplace, you know, kind of like um, the love languages, right? Many of us talk about in our relationships and it's like, what is the trust language that we need to be discussing and talking about to get what we need out of the workplace? So as an employee, if I don't trust the people I work with, what do I need to, what has to change about my dialect to get what I need out of this situation? So for example, if transparency is not present, what do I need to say? What language and what kind of conversations do I need to have with my manager or my colleague where demonstration of transparency is low trust, right? So how do we get to high trust in having that conversation, saying what we mean without saying it mean? But then on the other side of it, if you're a leader, I de- don't delve really into this is you come into a situation whether you inherited or you created it, but what do you need to have everyone on your team at least trust. Even if we have to lay off two weeks from now, do your employees trust you that you have their best interest in mind, right? That you're being transparent, that we didn't just have a team meeting, a team building exercise and a team building retreat telling everybody you are valued. And then with no regard, you get the, somebody comes to your desk with the box, (laughs) you know, like, yeah. How, how did those that's a weird juxtaposition, right? You could still have trust even when you have to make tough decisions. And then I have a three prong is HR, right? I teach a course at, at NYU and um, one of the sections that I talk about is this Harvard Business Art, uh, Review article entitled Why Everybody Loves to Hate HR. And it's like, it's, <laughs> and, and listen, I want trust restored there too, because I feel like HR is the nucleus of the workplace, right? So if people don't trust HR, then where are you supposed to go, right? And so I would look at it from three angles, employee management leadership, and then HR, because again, nobody can do their best work if the ecosystem is disrupted. The employee perspective to me is fascinating because I have been on the other end of like, HR is not your friend. We don't trust you. And I've had to like work actively to build trust with employees who have either been hurt by previous teams and just don't trust me or think that I'm always going to have the best interest at heart. So when we're talking about this and HR, what can HR do to actually restore that trust? Is it possible? I think that it is possible because... There was, I can't remember the exact statistic, but one of these like trust barometers, they said, you know, they did a a survey around how many people trust HR, right? And people, they were saying that they trust the stranger next door before they go to HR. And I thought that that was really interesting. And so I feel like number one, HR, and again, I'm not an HR practitioner. I just Play. I have great colleagues like yourself that that work in the HR space, but I do think some rebranding needs to take place in terms of what is the function, right? I know every workplace is not created the same, but if HR is not that hub for everybody, then let's be honest about that. But like, this yeah. is the place yeah. that you come for X, Y, and Z. If you have another issue that we cannot necessarily partner on you with, then we will create an independent entity or a hotline, anonymous hotline, because we want people to feel like they do have a voice in the workplace. And maybe HR isn't your friend, right? So let's have that conversation about what is the function of HR. And I think everybody can get on the same page if we understand what role everyone plays in the workplace. And I think that goes back to transparency. I can trust my HR liaison if they say, you know what, Minda, I'm here to help you with these particular things. But when it comes to any legal matters, I do have to you know, protect my company because I work for it, right? And I think, what would the dynamics be if we actually were honest with each other, right? Part of the book, Hiba, is why are we lying so much at work? <laughs> right? and I'm not- we're lying all the time. I, I, I say the same thing. We're lying in interviews. We're pretending to be something we're not constantly. I'm like, why? 
Like, what do we have to gain? Exactly. So not just HR, right? And I don't think, I think HR is in a, in a, a rock and a hard place oftentimes, right? And so I, they're not the enemy, but how do we restore the trust so that if I can't go to HR, I don't feel that I can, or I can't go to my manager, then who the heck am I supposed to go to at work? And I think that's the piece. Like there has to be some level of trust that people say, okay, I understand that workplace politics is a thing. But at the end of the day, my company sees me. They value what I have to say. I don't have to be afraid to contact HR when something bad has happened. I don't have to be afraid. You know, in my experience in the workplace, when I spent 15 years in corporate America, many of my colleagues had issues with HR, but I became friends with certain HR partners, right? And so I had a person that I could go to. I had somebody I could trust, but I had to seek that out. And that shouldn't have been, I shouldn't have been an a, a outlier to have that experience, right? And so I, I do think that HR has to be empowered by the leadership to actually do their job, right? And again, that's the trust. Um, and, and so I'm excited to talk about trust in a way that we haven't talked about it in the past and really restore trust because I think that we all can do our best work if we didn't have this layer of anxiety at every turn. There's a lot of distrust for HR, and and I don't blame a lot of people. Like We sit at a very unique spot between what the business needs and what the people need, and oftentimes those are in conflict with each other. And it's really hard to be the person who has to say, like, I have to make this business decision, which is not a people pro decision. Like, this is not good for the people. Layoffs amongst hard times. Like, I don't think any HR person at all wanted to lay people off. But if it was lay people off or your business survives, they're going to pick the business. Even I mean, like HR doesn't even have a pick, like the CEO is going to pick the business. And so I do think HR is like having a rebranding moment. And the way I deal with it is I just tell people up front, like, I care about you as an employee. I'm going to try to do what's best for you. There are times that are going to come where I'm going to have to also balance what the business needs. At the end of the day, my goal here is to make sure the business is successful and you are successful. But sometimes both parties don't win. And I think a lot of people find that very refreshing. I'm just like a very direct person. So I just tell people where it's at constantly. And I think a lot of HR people are getting to that point where they see how much the employees distrust them and they're turning to honesty as the best way to build that trust. I love that you are role modeling what it could look like. You know, we're all adults at work. Give it to us straight with no chaser. <laughs> Give it to us. You know, I'm like, really rather good. sell it like it is because then- I can prepare, right? When I was in my former life, I had this manager and he ended up, there was some furloughs coming and he wasn't supposed to tell people that they were coming, right? But he gave it to us straight like a month or so before. And he's like, listen, I could probably lose my job for this. I'm not supposed to tell you, but I value each of you. You have lives outside of this. So I don't know who's going to get laid off. I don't know who's going to get furloughed, but prepare for what might come, right? And him just saying that, it changed my dynamics because I had a couple of months to prepare for when I was cut, my salary was cut 7%. I was one of the people that got to stay working, but I could figure out what I needed to do instead of just, you know, an email come out four days before, hey, guess what? Surprise. Here's what's coming down the pipeline. And I'll never forget the relationship. I didn't think too much of him. I was just like, okay, he's a manager, whatever. But my trust in him and what I looked for in a leader going forward Right. You know, Mark Benioff at um, Salesforce, he talks about having a reservoir of trust. And it's like we have to build that up in the workplace so that we have currency to tap into it when we need it. Right. And so he couldn't stop us from getting laid off and furloughed, but he could prepare us. Right. And that's the difference between, I think, pretending that things that the smoke is not coming from the kitchen as opposed to saying, hey, here's an extinguisher. Let's all get prepared for when this smoke does come. I feel like with managers, they also sit at that very unique spot too, but similar to HR, they're trapped between like what leaders want and what the employees want. And those are definitely in the last year we've observed have been at odds with one another. And so I think for managers listening, trying to be as honest as possible with your team about what you can and cannot do just wins over their trust. And the second piece of it is I just think be genuine. So many people like your employees can sniff through when people are being disingenuous so fast and nothing makes them lose trust faster than them being like, that's a bullshitter. Like that person's lying to me. I can't believe it. And then that trust is like an uphill battle to win back. 
So I love that your manager did that. More managers, I think, should do stuff like that. He shouldn't have been the norm, right? Because he didn't tell us everything that was going to be rolled out, but he brought humanity to the team. He saw us as individuals, right? And I think sometimes as managers, we forget that we sat on the other side of the table. And I think that's what we have to remind ourselves. What about the humanity? Because you can't have safety without trust, right? It's just, you're never going to be able to work in a a safe place. And so many managers and leaders and HR professionals will say psychological safety, psychological safety. Well, trust is part of psychological safety. It's so interesting. So we've had a year, we've had such a year in the market with a lot of layoffs. Like the layoffs have been going on almost a year. I think every employee I've talked to recently has said that they are just distrustful of their employer now because the layoffs really shook a lot of people's lives up. Every day on LinkedIn, you see the post where people have been laid off for months on end and can't find a job. And it's it's really hard to see. And, and I have so much empathy for them. But after an employer has done a layoff, how do they actually rebuild that trust back? That's a great question. And it, it's something that I'm grappling with in the, in the book that I'm writing right now. Um, it's not on priority yet, but keep, keep an eye out, folks. It's called Talk to Me Nice. So when my former company had the layoffs, Outside of my manager, no one talked about it. It was like, here's the email, right? We had an email that was sent out company-wide. This is happening. Your manager will let you know which side you fall on this. And then we just kept working. No one ever talked about it. It was just like this thing that, oh, nothing to see here, right? And your colleagues that you're working with day in, day out, you were in the break room birthday party with, you they're no longer there, right? And now you sit working with that angst of, is it me? Am I next? Right. And you, and you can't really, again, focus on doing your good work under those restraints. And I think I often think had we had a little more transparency, had we had better communication about it. Right. Again, even on all staff with the CEO saying, hey, I know it's a tough time. Right. But I think the part is that we won't acknowledge. And I think, again, everyone's an adult for the most part that's in the workplace. Right. Most, <laughs> most of us are for the most part on, on paper. Right. And so people, regardless of who you are, a language of trust is transparency. A language of trust is that security. Right. And so how do we move past it? We we acknowledge it. We say the hard part out loud. But together, this is how we move forward. We give a game plan. Right. We assure people we hold quarterly town halls, you know, and I think, again, it goes back to the humanity piece. And I'm really focused on the tangible things that get people to say, okay, I understand that it's a tough economy out here. I understand that everybody's trying to figure this thing out, but we're talking about it. We're preparing for it, right? We're upskilling our employees in case they do have to do something different, right? <laughs> you know, a different job function. And I think, again, it's communication. And I'm suggesting conflict resolution because here's a conflict. How do we resolve it? We can't just pretend that these things are and sweep them under the rug. How many more things are we going to sweep under the rug until it's this big mountain that we can't even see our computers get on Zoom, right? Because the mountain was so high because of all the things we've swept under the rug. So for me, I think we need conflict resolution in the workplace because I don't think our managers have the right language to communicate how to move no. forward. And employees don't either, right? And it's this tension that nobody wants to talk about. And so I'm really advocating for good communities communication skills, effective communication skills. And if we don't have those, then let's use our HR, partner with our HR or talent development and make sure that everybody has the tools to use during these time periods instead of putting blinders on. That shouldn't be the, the go-to tool. Can I tell you, I've just, I've worked with so many leaders that are afraid to say the hard thing. And I've worked with them on why they are afraid. And I think like it still comes back to like, well, the employee is going to have a bad reaction. And I always, every time in that conversation say, well, they're going to have a bad reaction if you don't say anything too. So like, what advice would you give a leader who's just like afraid to say the right thing or afraid to say anything, honestly? I sound like a broken record, uh, Hibba, but it goes back to part of why I'm writing this book is because we have to restore trust in a broken workplace. Um, there's a song by Drake called Trust Issues. All of us have trust issues to some degree. <laughs> okay. I love Drake. That's for a separate, that's a separate side topic. <laughs> we we all I feel are that. experiencing these trust issues. And so as a manager, yes, but that's your you're paid to be, you pay the cost to be the boss. 
that's why you're in that position. That's part of your job description is to have the conversations with your team. Your team can't have them because they're not privy to some of the information that you have. But again, restoring humanity. How would you want someone to show up for you when a difficult decision has to be made? How would you want somebody to express that and articulate what that looks like, right? If your your uh, CEO comes in tomorrow and says, pack your stuff, you're out of here, you would have liked to have some leeway. We ask our employees to give at least a two-week notice on certain things. So why are we even providing that safety yep. net to our if you have a tough conversation, you know that you have to have it on Friday and you're giving it on Thursday, that gives nobody to prepare, right? And so again, how do we restore trust? We restore humanity. Put yourself back in the seat of that person that's the nine to five or what would you have wanted your good manager to say to you? Even if it's a tough conversation, again, I always hold on to two things, saying what you mean without saying it mean. You can say exactly what you mean and let people know, give people the option. Give people a choice. We still are have power of choice. You've given them the information, then they get to decide what the next best step is for them. And then the other thing is Brene Brown. She said, being clear is kind. Being unclear is unkind, right? So when we're clear about what the picture looks like and being honest about it, but saying, hey, we understand this is a tough time, but here are the actions that we're taking, right? And if you need any additional support, HR can be that next step for you, right? Give people some some options. Use your words. You don't have an option. Equity is not optional. It's mandatory. And in order to give people equity, we have to have the hard conversation so that they have the necessary information to do what's best for them. Ready to put social media to work for your organization? Hootsuite is the social media software for businesses of all sizes, from the mom and pop down the street to Ikea, Domino's, and the World Health Organization. And Talus, Europe's largest paper and comms distributor, uses Hootsuite for talent acquisition. They cut down the time it takes to recruit new employees by three weeks using Hootsuite. Find out how you can do the same at Hootsuite.com. How do you take your team from I hate it here to I love it here? I'll tell you with 15.5. Their comprehensive performance management solution equips HR professionals to identify early signs of disengagement, empower managers to build stronger relationships with top performers, and foster a culture of mutual growth where employees can truly thrive alongside the business, leaving you to never worry about retention again. Visit 15.5.com slash demo to schedule a demo today. The hard conversation is so important, but I have this theory. I don't actually think it's a theory. I think everyone believes this. Everyone is bad at communicating. I don't know if it's just because the internet era and we're we're quick to fire off texts, slacks, DMs. I just feel like somewhere along the line, we all got really bad at communicating and then the world went fully remote during COVID and those miscommunications just got exasperated. And so I just like, I think about trust in an era of us being online all the time And it's so easy for things to break down. Like, I don't know the tone in which you're saying anything on a written message because it's impossible to ascertain tone from a written message. So what would you recommend to people who are trying to build trust in this remote era when communication just feels broken across the board? Yeah. You know, what I, what again, I'm going to go back to two things. I think having some conflict resolution training, I think every you know, just like many companies have mandatory sexual harassment training uh, that yeah. even if people have to click through them or whatever is happening with those. Yeah, <laughs> is you happy. still have to do them. Yes, <laughs> you still have to do them. And I think to your point, a lot of us have been socialized to avoid conflict. I mean, look mm-hmm. at it in your personal life. If you're not doing it in your personal life, then you sure as hell ain't doing it at work. To be clear, I love conflict. I love conflict. (laughs) Adam Grant wrote in his originals book about how like the conflict you observed growing up informs the conflict and how you behave in conflict in the workplace. And like my family structure was like we always had things to debate and conflict was like seen as just like an effort to learn more from each other. And so I love conflict and people think I am wild when I say that. They're like, what? Why? I'm like, because you learn. You're learning something through conflict. And they think of it as a negative thing, right? But it's not yes. what you say, it's how you say it. And so I was socialized in a household where we didn't talk about tough things, right? And it was, oh, that bad thing took place. Okay, all right, Bury let's, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Bury it. This that's, is what it is, right? And so I had to push myself to say, you know what? I can't 
move through my life uh, with the covers over my head. I can't move through because other people that I'm managing need something from me and I'm going to get the best out of them when I meet them at a level of not just basic bones, right? And I said, what is the, the highest standard of communication? And that's honesty, right? And that's trust. And I think, again, it's very difficult because not all of us come to the table with the same communication tools, but we all, again, are adults enough to say, how do I upskill? Let's be honest with ourselves. Another part of trust is self-awareness. If you know that you're not a good communicator, and I'm sure that people have told you along the way, there's been indicators of that along the way, think about it. And then what can you do, right? There's a book called Difficult Conversations. It's part I, uh, by Douglas Stone and a couple of other writers. And I tell every leader that I coach or manage or teach, pick up this book because you can't be avoided of conflict, but you can understand how to dive in and how to navigate it and how to bring it back to center. And again, I think as a leader and a manager, we can't opt out of the difficult conversation because that is part of our job description, right? And so think about it again, if I'm willing to tell you the good stuff and the bad stuff, quote unquote, at work, then you can trust me better because you know that I'm not just I'm not holding on to certain biases. You know, I'm not trying to keep the the wool over your eyes. Right. Again, part of part of trust, part of working on a good team is understanding that if we don't have trust, how do we rebuild it? And if you have not been a good communicator up until this point, you know what? We have, again, power of choice. You get to decide, you know, I didn't do it right yesterday. And when I get it wrong, I go to my team and I say, you know what, I got it wrong last week, but I'm committed to doing it right. Right. And I think, again, when we make mistakes and admitting our faults, because, again, everybody is going to make mistakes inside the workplace because we're human. But when we avoid it each and every time or so or you hear someone on your team say, oh, I can't talk to them because X, Y and Z, you don't want that to be a theme. Again, let's go back to rebranding. If this has been who you are, let's show up differently tomorrow because communication is something we can actively change. It's so fascinating you said, because I think like on the conflict management piece, every HR person I meet, I actually ask them like, do you like conflict or not? And if they say no, I say like, you maybe shouldn't, you shouldn't be in HR because like our job at its very core is like we're in conflict between two major parties. And then we also have to check all the leaders at every organization. We have to check their biases. We have to check their behavior. We have to check their communication. And so if you don't like conflict, like I would not say HR is the job for you because honestly you have to. But then the second piece of that is like who we are at work is so interesting because our, our lives, our experiences are made up of our like everything we've lived in our life until then. And I feel like at a certain point, it's really hard to change who you are, your personality. And so when we're dealing with like people who are bad communicators in the workplace, I feel like a lot of them are just like, well, this is who I am. This is how I talk. And I'm like, well, you can't. And past that, I've like, I, that's the part where I've gotten really sticky with some leaders is like, how do I push them then to realize they have to? And I think this reframe of like, you'll never build trust with your team, your employees, anyone, if you don't fix the things you're bad at is a really important leadership lesson that I don't think enough people have learned. Well, thank you for calling that out because again, a lot of the things that are that we're battling with in the workplace are rooted in emotion, right? And mm -hmm. I think if we understand, you know, it it's so funny, Hibba, you probably you know know there was a point in the workplace where there was this narrative of don't bring anything personal to work, keep your personal life outside, all these sorts of yep. things. Um, and now it's bring your authentic self to work, bring your authentic self to work. And it's like, okay, how do we balance between that? And so bring the best parts of yourself, but the pieces of yourself that you know, you know what, I couldn't be better at this. And again, it goes back to being self-aware. And I think as managers, as leaders, we also have to take accountability for when we do fail our team, right? And when we do fail ourselves, because don't you want to be the best manager? I just want to challenge any manager or aspiring manager out there right now, Go to your team during the next team meeting or a next one-on-one -on -one and say, ask the one question, do you trust me? Putting that out there. And if somebody says no, being courageous enough to listen to them, to say, you know what, thank you for sharing that with me. How can we restore this trust, right? Mind shift. Even if, think about just that one question, putting it out there to someone who is sitting day in and day out, sees you on that screen, almost hates your guts because they can't trust you, but you're asking <laughs> that question because you care, you're aware, you want to know what where you've gone wrong, you want to know where you've gone right, right? And what Emma yeah. needs in the workplace is different than what Minda needs, 
right? And I need to get to the point of, I might have the trust of three out of five, but what about the two that don't? What can I do so that we can have the most productive team? Because when the team is teaming, we get to the end state that we need, right? And again, I think people say, you don't have to like me, but they should be able to trust you. And I think that's what I hope we get to in the workplace. Oh, I love that. I'm going to go ask my team, do you trust me? I know she's going to say yes, but like I'm so going to ask. I have high trust. I have high trust with her. Um, your book, The Memo, was all about women of color and what they need to know to secure a seat at the table. Um, in this book, Talk to Me Nice, is there going to be any section that talks about how identity and trust play into each other? So I, I kind of consider this a, a, a crossover album, if you will, because I've been writing about women of color in the workplace for you know many years now. And what I realized was now it's time to have a larger conversation, a larger conversation with our leaders, our managers to say, again, everybody is experiencing this, but think about the person that is the only, right? What is mm-hmm. their trust mm-hmm. uh, barometer? Where where are they at in the in the workplace? Or mothers, right? We had so much flexibility during COVID. And now you're like, get your buttons back to work. (laughs) Great. What happened to the flexibility? It was okay to have my child on my lap during 2020. (laughs) But if I bring my not anymore, but if I bring my kids to work, now I'm looked at as a a bad parent, right? Get them, you know, all these different things. And it's like, okay, everybody is experiencing this and everybody's feeling marginalized to some degree (laughs) at work because we can't talk to people the way we need to. We're not getting the answers that help us do our work uh, in the best way. And so I will always center those who are not hard in the workplace because if me as a black woman doesn't feel trust, then a trans person is not going to feel trust. Then a woman is not going to feel trust. Someone who is disabled is not going to feel trust, right? And so it's all interconnected. And so I really wanted to, again, bring the focus back to trust plus safety equals humanity, right? And when we have those things inside the workplace, then everybody gets the best. It's not musical chairs, right? If Joe has trust, then Linda can't have trust. <laughs> then yeah. Karen can't have trust. Right? We can all create a workplace in which we democratize who gets who gets to be trusted, who looks trustworthy, right? Who gets to feel that? And so I'm writing this book because I want us to have a community conversation about how we restore trust so that everybody experiences it. You may, again, not like the job function that you do, but trust should not be an option. It should be mandatory. And we should almost uh, give people, I don't know, trophies or awards for those who are willing to do the work because it's important. Yeah. You know, we're not going to have the future of work. The future of work cannot be sustained. We cannot get to a future if we don't have trust. And, and I'm very much, I put my stake in the ground on that because uh, I just think it's gone out the window and it's only going to get worse if we don't tap in. Have you read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team? I have. It's like the the baseline is trust. Like every team is dysfunctional when there's not trust. And so I love, one, I'm just so excited to read this book when it does come out. And I love that you are writing about these things because it's it's impossible as HR to do our jobs effectively if there is no trust. If the employees don't trust the leaders, don't trust their managers, don't trust us, don't trust each other, there's no way to build a great workforce and a place where people feel like they belong, that they can challenge ideas, that they're safe unless there is trust. And so I think like every leader needs to be thinking about this. I think every HR person needs to be thinking like, do my employees trust me? And I wrote about this earlier in the year about like the say do gap for HR where we say we care about the employees, but then sometimes we do something different. And that gap is where we lose a lot of trust with them. And so I just think like it is just so important for every HR person to think that there's trust. The one thing that I think is really hard, though, is we try to be transparent, but then also a lot of our work is confidential. And so, like, what's how do you balance that, like the need for transparency with the must of confidentiality? I'm glad you brought that up because it is a nuanced situation, right? And I think that, again, it goes back to transparency. If historically HR has been a certain function or has been thought of in this way, how do we say, okay, in 2020, whatever, this is what it looks like. This is what HR looks like. This is what we're able to do. This is what you can come to us for. And if we're not able to be that conduit in this particular case, then let's have an independent practitioner or whatever that looks like to be able to say, this is where you go for these type of issues, right? And I think it's unfair. This is me on the outside looking in. It's unfair to say, 
HR has to be all these things to everybody. It's impossible. It's impossible. And so I think that part of the rebranding is understanding what is the function of HR? What should it be in the future of work? And I think that's most important because I think people can wrap their head around, oh, HR is supposed to serve this function for me. So now I don't have to look at them as a bad guy because they're providing the service, right? But when we put everything under the HR umbrella and think that, oh, this is the people place. And then as a people, I'm not getting what I need from that. (laughs) But it always seems like my manager is, you know, it's like, okay, then how do we, we're not going to be in a trusted situation. It's going to always be a low trust environment, right? And so again, I think it's part of saying, what is the role that HR wants to play in the future of work and start establishing where that is. And HR shouldn't be the catch-all for everything. And I think that's part of how we re- rebuild trust is understanding who does HR want to be and who do they need to be? And not having, it's like this weird relationship, right? Like you have this expectation of everything and maybe I'm not going to get all my love languages from HR. I'm only going to get Definitely two. not. So understanding that, right? Understanding that, especially you think about those entering the workplace as a first time in the, in the you know, entry level or, you know, first year out of college or trade school, what that looks like for someone who's like, where am I supposed to go? Right. You know, I can't go. I don't feel like I can go to my manager. I know for me, when I was experiencing the worst of the worst in the workplace as the only black woman in the workplace, HR wasn't a place I can go. My manager wasn't a place I can go. My pillow was the place to go where I was (laughs) always crying. Crying or screaming. Should it be the place, right? There shouldn't be a place where trust is part of work. And I I do think, to your point, if we all want to do the best work and we want to create a high class working environment to where people can look at each other and say, they were honest with me and I respect them. I I understand. I mean, it changes the dynamics. It changes the atmosphere. It changes an abusive environment, a toxic environment into one that we're saying, you know what? We had a hard day, but my manager was honest about what's coming down the pipeline. HR was honest about, I can't do this, but you need to maybe call the EEOC. (laughs) They were honest with me. It's just so interesting too. I think the other piece of confidentiality is like, I have employees that ask me things all the time that are confidential. And honestly, I just got to the point where I just say, you know, I can't tell you that. And here's why. And uh, it works every time. They're like, wow, thank you for being transparent about why you won't tell me that thing. And I'm like, well, if only I knew all I had to do is tell them I can't tell you it's confidential and explain to them why it's confidential. Then I just feel like that just builds trust with the employees. They're like, okay, I know this thing is off limits. I know she can't tell me about it. I also know why she can't tell me about it. And that I think is just as wonders for trust. Um, I just, this has been such a great conversation. I cannot wait to read your book. When does it come out? I know you're still writing it. Like, is that rude to ask when it comes out? So no, uh, I'm still writing it right now. So I'm trying to not give you everything right now. So then people are like, I don't have to read the book, but it's the pre-order will go out uh, mid next year and the book will either drop late 2024, top of 2025, but I'll be dripping stuff out. So if you are on LinkedIn, follow me there. Cool. Okay. Also, we didn't talk about this at all, but I'm a huge Drake fan. And I know the memo, I read the part where Trophies inspired the memo's title. Are all your books titled or references to songs? Because right within, I thought of Lauren Hill right away. Yeah. And she says, how are you going to win when you ain't right within? Yes, actually, um, you're right. Drake was tr- Drake was Trophies. Did your boys not get the memo? And then uh, Lauren Hill is how you going to win if you ain't right within. You Are More Than Magic was a play on just black girl magic that we aren't this, you know, fictitious thing that it actually takes grit and hard work, determination to, to be and show up in this in this space. And then uh, Talk To Me Nice is from Beyonce's Renaissance album. She has a Virgo groove at the end. She says, talk to me nice. And I'm like, you know what? That's what we need in the workplace. We need to talk to each other nice in order to build trust. And, and that's through transparency and a whole bunch of other things. I'm so excited for that book. I can't wait. I will anxiously be awaiting all the drip coming out and pushing it in the newsletter. Um, okay, last question. It's the fun one, not about anything. What's your favorite Drake song? I would probably say Underground Kings um, off of his Take oh. Care album. It always gets me really pumped. Take Care, I think, is one of, I, I actually think it's his best album. It's between that and So Far Gone for me. I'm like, I'm an OG Drake fan, but my favorite Drake song, I honestly, I celebrate every year his birthday. I had my, I had my birthdays oh, that were themed, I Drake themed. My friends were like, can you 
quit this, it's getting weird. <laughs> I'm like, no, I love him. But my favorite Drake song is Fear because it's all about how when you get big, things change and people look at you differently and treat you differently and he just doesn't want that to happen. I just love that song. It's great. Well, you know, now that I know we are vibrating on this freq- on this Drake frequency, <laughs> um, I, I like you even more, Hibba, so thank you for, for sharing. I, I thought I was ill. I thought... I mean, you know, when people say, what is your toxic trait? And I think it might be that I'm a Drake, a Drake fan because <laughs> it's like, it's like he, he wears this on his sleeve, but he can be toxic at the same time. It's part of the workplace and we all want a better, a better us, a better version of ourselves. And we get that sometimes from yeah. Aubrey. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> he, inspi- he inspires me so much, honestly. we could, That's like a whole separate podcast episode. All my friends could tell you I could talk about him at length forever and take care of Literally from start to finish, I can do every single song, and it is it's such a good album. We we have to go to karaoke one day, and, and there's nothing but Drake, in. Drake songs. Okay. There are thousands of videos out there of me doing Drake at karaoke, and all my friends are like, "Quick, rap this whole thing!" And I'm like, "I've been practicing. I'm ready." Um, I just love that we ended it on this tone. Okay, one last thing. They're gonna probably edit some of me going back and forth on this. One last thing. If you were to leave HR people with one thing to think about as they are building trust, I know you told everybody to go ask their team, do you trust me? Is there anything else you would leave them with today? First of all, thank you for your service. Okay, I don't think that HR, (laughs) I don't think HR (laughs) practitioners uh, get the love and support that they deserve. You're on in the trenches, you're in the war fields, and you get so much that comes your way. And so I just want you to be reminded that your function matters, right? But you get you should get to decide what your function looks like going to the future of work, because you do set at an interesting intersection, both with employee and leadership and take your power back. Because a lot of leaders are telling you what it is. And you are the coach to coach them to greatness, right? And so part of the rebrand is reminding where the power really truly lies because they can't do their work without you. And so let's reframe what the role of HR is. And I'm just excited to see how HR can be trusted again because we need you. We, we can't do this work thing without you. Oh my God, I'm going to listen to the end of this podcast episode every day when I wake up because I was like just the motivational speech I needed. It is so hard to do this job. I'm so thankful that you called that out. And I and I don't want it to feel like I'm always saying this, but I do think it is one of the hardest jobs at any organization is being the HR person who is bombarded with everything, who's sought out to do everything, who's looked at to build the trust when a lot of times the trust is a leader's job. And we're looked to as HR, like, fix it. And I'm like, I can't fix the problems you made because people don't trust you. So thank you for acknowledging that. And like, there's a lot of magic in HR happening and a lot of people that are listening to this podcast that are trying to figure out how do they reshape their workplace and the future of work as a whole. So thank you so much for joining me today, Minda. I cannot wait for your next book. I'm so glad I know you. I can't wait to exchange Drake quotes whenever you want. Um, and anyone you can find her on LinkedIn you can follow her on Twitter and you also have a podcast as well right I do secure the seat but you know go to mindaharts.com thank you so much Hibba for everything and for your support Uh, today was a great way to start my day through this conversation so thank you heck yeah not better than the Beyonce concert you saw this past weekend just second to that very very close second very close second (laughs) thanks for tuning in Keep up with all the latest HR resources by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen. And if you love I Hate It Here, tell an HR friend. I'll see you next time.